we start today with an extraordinarily difficult topic, and one in which each of you in your different ways has been a remarkable leader for, uh, the, for the people of the past, the present, and the future. And let me start by going around to each one of you with a general question. And that is, what is the value for individuals and for society of our making the effort to understand the history and human reality of terrible hardship, of atrocity, um, of genocide, of slavery, of oppression? Why is it that we should do this? And perhaps I could start with Dr. Swinsky. Thank you. Uh, I think the value are different in the different steps after some uh, trauma, like in an individual life, let's say. If you are under a traumatic experience, first you, you are under the shock, after you follow, uh, you, you, you f yes, it's, it's, it's a time of silence, let's say, after you try to understand, you try to speak, and you maybe uh, arrive to a moment when you, when you, uh, when you arrive to, to, to a perception of the future, how to, how to getting out of this trauma. And uh, now, when the, when the last survivors are, are passing out, I think we are, we are in this last period, we understand better than it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago that the remembrance is a key to understand the, the present time and certainly a key to, 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 to create a, a better future. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, how about you? You have excavated untold histories and systems that allowed uh, for slavery. What is the value of reaching back to pull those stories and those um, experiences into the present? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a um, pleasure to be here. Um, I th I'm thinking of a couple of things. Um, fighting ignorance uh, is a big thing, because in the Netherlands up to the 2000s, we were taught that slavery was an American history, not Dutch history, let alone you know, the history of this city or any other city. Um, I think it's also recognizing um, you know, p histories of families, individuals that have been silenced, but also collectively taking accountability, I think, yeah. um, is really, really important. And it um, shows us the way to the future, because if you don't know, you know the, our past, then um, you're not going to enter the future wholly as a, as a, you know, yeah. as a community, yeah. I would say. Um, let me follow up for a second. So, uh, and any of you could address this, but how do you deal with the line of thinking that goes, oh my goodness, why do we have to bring up these past horrors? It's just going to create dissension. It's, you know, we got to move on. We got to turn the page. H how do you deal with that? Well, um, keeping the conversation going, yeah. uh, keeping it on the table. The thing is, people become uncomfortable. You know, but in the 60s in the Netherlands, um, people weren't talking about the, the Jewish um, population. Uh, every other Dutch person was part of the resistance, for instance. So people had to learn to become, you know, sensitive to the Jewish community. The same should go for the history of slavery. We should you know, you should keep talking about it. Um, people, yeah, and, and so um, go beyond that uncomfortability. And, and also, you know, on the way, develop an idiom uh, that uh, acknowledges that past, but also makes a connection to things like race, yeah. for instance, because, again, in the Netherlands, we don't have a shared, well-developed idiom on race. Yeah. And we're always pointing to the U.S. like, oh, you know, we don't want to... Um, introduce your discourse here, but it was Europe and it was the Netherlands to, who exported race to the Americas, not the other way around. Yeah. It's interesting, this, this notion of an idiom. We in the United States are constantly struggling over language right now. Who used what word to describe what circumstance? Who has the authority or legitimacy to speak on which topic? Um, you're a mayor, you have some degree of authority. We know that mayors <laughs> have maybe more persuasive power than power to just will what you want into being. But how do you deal with this question in San Francisco of the various pasts of your city and the various communities that look back 
to a time when wrong was done to them. Well, it's interesting because being here, I really reflected on this when I visited the Anne Frank Museum. And what was interesting about that experience is I saw a family there with kids who were probably like five or six. And you had parents explaining to their children how this kid was basically not able to play with other kids, not able to see the light, not able to do the things that these children are fortunate enough to take for granted. Um, you have these kinds of situations, but you also sadly have parents who are raising kids quite differently. Yeah. The importance of really making sure um, that these stories are told is to make sure that people understand and know history, but also they understand what needs to be done to not repeat it and, and also make the investments around po uh, financial, uh, financial investments, policy changes, and other things that are going to help to get us to a better place. As elected leaders, we have to be prepared to make bold action, and sometimes it's not always popular. I remember when, you know, because our trans community in San Francisco is highly discriminated against, and when you look at the data, people talk about the data all the time, you know, disproportionately no. who's impacted by the data. We know what the problems are, but the question is, are we prepared for the solutions? So I introduced universal income for our trans community, uh, uh, trans home SF, and a number of initiatives that helped to target the disparities. And what was interesting was really a lot of the negative, you know, comments that came as a result of that. But I know oftentimes people in elected capacity, they want to be popular, they want people to love and praise what they do. But I think we're at a different point in history where we need to really focus on the right thing and moving things forward uh, to really correct some of the injustices of the past. Now, San Francisco is the home of... <laughs> San Francisco is the home of Angel Island, which was a location where many uh, Chinese would-be immigrants came and waited and waited and waited only to be sent back to China um, and to die on that passage to or from. Uh, today, the Asian American community in San Francisco and around America has experienced a real spike in discriminatory action, hate crimes. Um, this isn't a San Francisco problem, this is an American problem, but how are you thinking about that problem in particular? It's been so complicated in San Francisco and, you know, we have a over 30% Asian population in particular and many of our Asian seniors have been targeted. Um, of course, part of it is accountability and consequences for those behaviors that cross the line. But the other thing is bridge building, yeah. learning about one another's culture, bringing people together. I was so proud of people in the black community um, who basically stood up and said, we're going to go and patrol and keep people in Chinatown safe as a result of all the things that were happening, having those discussions, learning about one another, continuing to come together because, you know, that's going to be an important part of how we move forward. And, you know, what you find out is there's so much more that we have in common um, than we do uh, in terms of our differences. And, and we got to keep these conversations going. We got to keep providing opportunities for people to come together um, because that's really what's going to help us get there. But we also, again, as I said, need to be prepared to take bold action when necessary. Um, the mayor, we, well, we met chief heat officers yesterday. Maybe the mayor is the chief hope officer, the chief mm -hmm. community officer, bringing the community together uh, to reweave the bonds of community. Uh, in times of trial. So I want to go back now to ask you a little bit about the role of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum. And I've, I've been there. Uh, extraordinary, never sort of forgettable experience. We are all told, never forget. Never forget. Um, and yet, you look around the world, and again and again, people are forgetting. And whether it's anti-Semitism, or genocide in different places in the world, or the unwillingness to acknowledge what has happened in the past, forgetting seems to be as much a part of people's sensibility as remembering. Uh, I hope that's not true, but how do you think about the role of Auschwitz-Birkenau given the realities of the world we live in today? Uh, I think we are living in a world in uh, 
some very, very quick changes, and, and those changes are more and more aggressive and quick, so we need terrifically some very strong referring point in our common experience, and Auschwitz is a symbol of a very heavy and difficult, but referring point, let's say, uh, in, in our history. That's why uh, before the pandemic there were 2.3 millions of visitors per year, uh, especially young people, and I hope that it will help them, it, it can help them certainly, to judge, to understand and to judge the present time, to find their own answer in their own society, uh, to find their own, let's say, responsibility uh, to, 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 to create something new, something better, something more human, let's say. Uh, this is, I think, the main goal uh, and the main hope that I have. If not, all these remembrance do not serve to anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had the experience after visiting Auschwitz of starting to read the memoirs of people who had survived. Um, and there were many. Jean-Amory, uh, Primo Levi, uh, Elie Wiesel, um, Viktor Frankl. Uh, it, all these individuals came out of that inferno with the need to tell their story, but the stories were different, even as they were also the same. How do you think about the, the voices of those who have survived? The extremely important uh, but very difficult to be heard because they are speaking in our language about a reality that is coming from a completely different world. Uh, we do not have an Auschwitz language to explain Auschwitz. We are speaking in our language. And, and this, is, this is the biggest problem. They are trying to translate their experience into the language of people who didn't experience that. Yeah. That is exactly what Jean Amory said, and he found the effort meaningless because he couldn't actually convey <laughs> what it was that... And that's why know. many of them didn't tell the story at all. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, Nancy, mm. in your work, um, how much of what you are doing allows you to bring back into public life the voices of those or the experience of those who were silenced? Or does your work focus more on the systems in Amsterdam and other places that... Uh, yeah that allowed others to be dehumanized? I think, yeah, a couple of things. W w uh, we're actually, you know, if you go into the city, and uh, I'm going to give a tour at 11.15, uh, where we're going to do a boat tour through uh, the city. If you look at the city, you can read it as an archive. Uh, there's so many material remnants uh, in the buildings, and, um, you know, it's just about, you know, changing your lens and starting to look differently at the city that you walk through, like I do, and others um, on a you know, daily basis. But those uh, material remnants are connected to people's stories. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, uh, what we're trying to do uh, when we you know, do these tours or theater makers imagine what the voices of you know, black women who are brought here as servants um, uh, you know, what they would be thinking or talking about. Um, you know, on Dutch soil proper, slavery was forbidden since the Middle Ages. So what was the, um, you know, legal position yeah. of people, enslaved people, who were brought in from Indonesia, South Africa, Burbese, um, New York, um, the Caribbean, to the metropole, to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam? Um, we don't know. Yeah. Um, so these are the stories, I think. So tell us something that we'll see, one thing we'll see on today's tour to whet our appetite. Well, we're going to actually pass the mayor's house, or, uh, you know, the mayor herself, and that house used to be owned by a slave uh, owner, uh, very simply. So, and if you just look at, you know, the 100 meters in that street, every, literally every um, house has a story. So I hope you know, some filmmaker one day will make a series out of that, just, you know, those hundred meters. There, there's tons of stories. And we're talking about a history that is global. Because from, you know, from the U.S., we're basically uh, taught that it's about the transatlantic slavery. Uh, but in the case of the Netherlands and Europe, I would say it's also about Indian Ocean slavery. Um, so we're talking about, um, you know, a global history if we talk about the Netherlands. Well, thank you. We're excited to see it today. Um, so let me ask you a, a, a question about the role 
of being the chief spokesperson for community, for justice, for humanity, for breaking down the barriers between us. It's a tough role. Mm -hmm. And um, what was it that made you want to take this role? Well, I think it had a lot to do with um, my experience of growing up in San Francisco in poverty and being frustrated. Like, I have this story that people are always amazed that, you know, I lived in poverty, raised by my grandmother, never knew my biological father, brothers in jail, sister died from a drug overdose. Like, it's like, oh my goodness, right? But that was almost everybody around me with something very similar. And I was angry that we felt isolated, that we felt like there were no opportunities. And I was just very blessed um, to have people who really helped to support me, to get me into college, to help me with scholarships and get through that. So now being mayor, because again, a lot of times people are, you know, you want to do the things you need to do to be elected, but I'm not afraid to lose my job. I think that it's important that when we do these jobs, we can't do them based on whether or not we're trying to get elected. We have to do them based on what we need to do to support the cities that we represent. And in fact, during the whole Black Lives Matter movement, you had so many people making commitments to the black community. We're gonna support the black community. All of this money was supposedly coming out of the sky and I'm still trying to understand, well, where is it? And in San Francisco, and, in, and I'll tell you, in San Francisco, we said we're gonna give $60 million and annualize it specifically, even though we have a less than 5% black population in San Francisco, it's like almost 40% of the homelessness, yeah. disproportionately in the terms of the overdose deaths, all of the, a lot of the disparities in our criminal justice system. We are going to commit to this every year, which includes economic opportunity, home ownership opportunity. We have a number of people who have already uh, closed on their fo first home, African Americans who grew up in San Francisco. So it's like, again, it, it can't just be the conversation or, or, or the theme of today or what's popular. It's how do you, after all of the lights and cameras go away, how do you still make it happen despite yeah. You know, all of that. And, and that's really what we need to start doing, not just elected officials, but like companies and, 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 and how we um, start to make those kinds of investments and step outside of just what we're trying to do for yeah. ourselves. How are we making society a better place by our time commitments, by our policy changes, by our financial investments? What are we doing to make things better? And that really can change the world. You, rem you remind me of that uh, great American philosopher, Mother Jones, mm -hmm. who said, we honor the dead by fighting like hell for the living. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for being here. We wish we had more time. What a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you.